Testing one, two, testing. Actually, in a half hour, we start. Greetings, everybody.
Hello?
عملتوا فيديو ولا صحيح؟ تقدر يا دكتور يعمل فيديو ندخل هنا؟ 
إذا Greetings, everybody. Hi, Dr. John. Hi, how are you doing today? Rashad? Yes, Dr. Rashad from Yemen. Welcome. Oh, welcome. Uh, did you present uh, last weekend when we had the conference? We are, uh, we will uh, follow you, inshallah. Good. Hey, Dr. Sawyer. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, I can. How are you, how are you doing? Fine, thank you much. Okay, the questions. Do you want me to show the questions before you start your talk or you want to show it or the questions think, before? I think if you show them before and then we'll, we'll do them at the end. Okay, you want me to show it or you want to show? It? No, no, you show. Okay. Okay, I think I have it in the file here. Let me see here. Yeah, I'll just leave it there.
Yeah, I'll just introduce you, and then you talk. You know, you talk, and then you say, "I'm going to show the questions now before, and then I'll show." Them. Okay. We got a couple of minutes. Last minute arrivals. Forward out. Down. down frequent. Your associate from Turkey, are you still busy? I, I can't hear you, Dr. Sibet, you, you're muted. I uh, said I, he did not contact me since then. He said he had a medical student arriving, so he would be busy. Okay, very good. Okay, we're gonna start 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Good afternoon from Miami Beach, home of Neurosurgical TV. Uh, we have the honor of hosting the uh, Jordan Neurosurgical Grand Rounds, led by Dr. Abraham Sabea, well-known Jordanian neurosurgery educator. And we're going to try something different tonight. But first, I'll turn it over to Dr. Sabea. Good evening. Good afternoon, Dr. Sabea. Good afternoon and good morning, good uh, evening for anybody who is living anywhere in the world. And uh, this time, as I said, we will be discussing the uh, Petrus bone lesions who concentrate on cholesterol granulomas. Uh, before I start the, uh, the uh, webinar, I'm going to ask you, John, to show some of the questions that we'll put at the end so that people will have time to think about it. By the end of the presentation, then we can actually discuss. Okay. You want to just go over them? Yeah. Uh, this question relates yeah. to the commonest petrus uh, apex. Do you want to do that, John? You go. Well, whatever you want to do. Okay, just yes, to... Please. please do go. Please do. Okay. Uh, well, you can just look at the questions, I guess. And uh, let me see if I can manipulate this. Okay. Common petrus lesion, common site. Just look at all these questions, I guess. So you'll be able to give correct answers at the end. Okay, and here's the other, the last six. Temporal bone made of how many parts? Horizontal segment of facial nerve. Okay, just give a second here. Okay, that should be sufficient, Dr. Sabea. Okay, it's over to you. And that's fine. That's fine. It's important people to have time to think about the questions and maybe concentrate on the answers as we, we go along. So we can start, John? Sure. All right. We'll do that. So here we are. Uh, my name is Ibrahim Sveh. I'm uh, a neurosurgeon from Jordan, and we are transmitting live from the Farah Medical Campus here in Amman, Jordan. And uh, as I always put the first slide is the black iris, which is the symbol of Jordan. Uh, we are now in the fall, in the autumn in Jordan. And this is one of the sceneries in the mountains there. As I said, people think of Jordan as a desert. It is not. Lots of mountains, lots of the beautiful scenery there. And we have the lowest point on Earth at the Dead Sea, and we have very high mountains up to 2,000 uh, feet above, uh, 2,000 meters above sea level. Uh, so the presentation is uh, my Petrus Bone Legions, uh, my personal experience with cholesterol granuloma, and as usual, we discuss the clinical, radiological, operative, and pathological uh, correlation. So before we start, we are talking about Petrus bone. Let's, let's see what's that. Uh, it says here, temporal bone poses unique challenge even to the most seasoned skull based surgeon. I really believe in that. I think temporal bone is the most difficult bone in the skull. It is the most difficult, complicated bone in our body. 
And to conquer it surgically, you have to conquer it by knowing its anatomy. So this is a beautiful view from Sana uh, textbook. Uh, we are on the right side. This is the middle fossa. And here, this is the facial nerve coming off here in the uh, lateral um, semicircular canal. This is the uh, tympanic part. This is the horizontal part coming out. This is tympanic membrane, the ossicles, the, uh, the semicircular canals, the superior, the lateral and posterior one, and jugular bulb, and the carotid archie coming in. It's a unique arrangement. So let's look carefully at the anatomy. Uh, this is sphenoid bone, occipital bone, so temporal bone may be communication of these bones here. And uh, the jugular foramen is actually uh, foramen between the occiput and temporal bone. Temporal bone is made of different parts, the squamous part, the petrous part, the tympanic part, which we are not seeing here inside, the mastoid part, which is this, thylomastoid part, which is this, and the zygomatic part, sorry, the zygomatic part, which is this. So, we forget always that there are three ossicles, three bones. So, people speak about six parts of the temporal bone. Please add three more. So, it is nine parts, nine bones, nine segments form the temporal bone. Don't forget the malus, incus, and the stabus. And these you can actually see on the uh, coronal CT scan, nadius, incus, and stapes here sitting on the uh, oval window. We speak about Petrus pyramid and Petrus apex. Let's discuss that. This is a view from the base of the skull, and you can see the shape of the Petrus bone is like a pyramid. Apex here, the base is here. This is a view that I took personally from my, the skull that I have in my clinic. I use it for teaching. This is the clivus, the condyle, the foramen magnum, and this is the petrous bone. As we see it, so this is the apex of the pyramid, this is of the pyramid. Again, the pyramidal shape, the petrous bone, the apex, and the base. Again, a view from the inside of the skull, the specimen that I have in my clinic. This is the petrous bone, this is petrous apex, and you can see that it is related here to the clivus, and you can see also that it has many surfaces. This is the base here, superior surface, this is the inferior surface, and we have the lateral surface. So, again, petrous bone, petrous apex, you can see the relationship with the clivus, which is the frozen sinus, jugular foramen between the petrous bone and the occipital bone. So again, let's concentrate on the pyramidal shape of the petrous bone, the base and the apex, and the structures that there are inside this pyramid. So we speak about the apex. This is the apex. And this apex of the petrous bone is related to the clivus, mainly. Laterally here is the inner ear, anteriorly here is the uh, carotid artery, and the foramen lacerum, and posteriorly here is the view of the posterior fossa. Same picture. A specimen from the cadaveric specimen that I had in my cadaveric lab. You can see here the petrous apex internal detrimiatus, you can see the, the nerves in. So we're speaking about this as an apex, where you have the trigeminal impression sitting there for the trigeminal nerve and the ganglion. So petrous bone, petrous bone, petrous apex, petrous apex, foramen lacerum, foramen lacerum, uh, foramen ovary and foramen spinosum. Those up view on the left side, you can see the mastoid, mastoid heart cells. You can see the external ear, the ossicles, the middle ear, internal detrimiatus, and the uh, petrous carotid ear and petrous apex. 
Again, I may go back here to show you the relationship, uh, uh, the close relationship of the sixth nerve going into the clivus, into the Rulus canal, uh, meeting the petra salix. Again, axillary view, this is external ear, the tympanic membrane, the three ossicles, and then the three semicircular canals, the tendotumiatus, the carotid artery, trigeminal nerve, we have the mastoid cells, mastoid junction. Okay, the brick picture showing the petrous one on the left side, petrous apex, the cochlea, the tendotumiatus, the three semicircular canals, the superior, the lateral and posterior, the uh, mastoid and mastoid cells. So this is the anatomy that one need to know. And it's rather a complex anatomy that must be mastered. Arcuit eminis related to the superior semicircular canal. The endolacrimal sac is here. The sigmoid sinus comes here to the jugular bulb. Internal detrimatus harboring the uh, cochlear nerve, vestibular cochlear and facial nerve, and the petrous apex. Sigmoid sinus and the petrous apex, and the parts of the temporal bone, the squamous, the petrous, and as I said, the rest of the segments that we saw from the outside. Like in here, squamous, mastoid, petrous, as we have seen, the tympanic, stylomastoid frame, stylomastoid part, and the zygomatic part. And don't forget to add the three ossicles. Squamous, zygomatic, mastoid, tympanic, petrous, and you can see the semicircular canals and the vestibule and the cochlea. And here, here, you can see the landmark of McEwen triangle, which points to the uh, mastoid antrum. And this is the facial nerve coming out from the stylomastoid foramen. This is a very beautiful uh, view from uh, Mario Sana book, uh, Professor Mario Sana from Italy. Beautiful uh, illustration showing you the complex anatomy in that area, which cannot be read easily, which cannot be read in a, in a glance. You really have to read it once, twice, thrice, maybe 10 times until you conquer it. And then you go into the academic lab to master it. Again, you can see the carotid artery coming in the neck to the petrous part, to the uh, paraclival part and the cavernous part, the um, jugular vein here, jugular bulb and the sigmoid sinus, the severe betrothal sinus here, and the inner ear here and the facial nerve coming out. So we need to know a lot about the facial nerve relationship in the petrous bone. Uh, as I mentioned in my previous lecture about the uh, vestibular schwannomas, the facial nerve has many segments. This is the cisternal segment. This is the meatal segment. This is the labyrinthine segment coming here to give the genicular ganglion and the greater superficial betrothal nerve. This is the tympanic part uh, or horizontal part. Uh, this is the uh, uh, so sort of going down of the facial nerve. Uh, into the stylomastoid frame and the vertical part. Of course, then we have the peripheral parts of the, of the facial nerve. Vestibular cochlear nerve in relationship to the vestibule and the cochlea. Again, here the ossicles, external ear, tympanic membrane, the station tube, relationship of the station tube to the carotid to the greater superficial detrusion nerve. Something that you need to fix rather than just know for a glance or for uh, just a presentation. Carotid artery is the most important structure here. And again, just to recapitulate, the common carotid, the internal carotid, goes into the, the uh, carotid canal here at the base of the skull. We are looking at the oblique view here, lateral view. And if we look at the base of the skull, you can see the carotid artery entering into the carotid canal and then going uh, medially and horizontally in the petrous bone to reach to the petrous apex at the foramen lacerum at the anterior genome of the uh, carotid artery. You can see these parts of the, of the carotid, especially the petrous carotid, which we are concerned 
now with these petrus um, uh, cholesterol granuloma. So this is the petrus part, this is the paracranial part, and this is the uh, cavernous part. Here is the part that we want to see, which is the petrus carotid, and this is in the cadaveric specimen. Then this is the petrus carotid part, and here it comes to the primal lacerum, and there is a ligament here, the petrolingual ligament fixing it uh, there. It's different from this uh, petrospinal ligament, a gruber ligament, which passes above the sixth nerve as it goes into the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus. The many segments of the carotid artery, the petrous segment, paraclival, and the petrous carotid, and it's emerging out the medial and underneath the anterior clinoid process. So this is the cervical part, this is the carotid canal, petrous, paraclival, and cavernous part, and this is the sixth nerve underneath the gruber ligament. Vidim canal is important anatomical landmark that we need to know in details because it's important for you as a neurosurgeon or as an endoscopist to, uh, as an open surgeon or endoscopist to, uh, to know the Vidim canal and the contents of the Vidim canal. Uh, with the nerve and with an arch and uh, uh, nerve. And you can see here the relationship and it's, it's a landmark for the petrous bone avix. So we are dealing with petrous bone and there in the petrous bone, we have the cholesterol granuloma. So what is this cholesterol granuloma? Is it just related to the temporal bone? The answer is no. It is situated in many areas of the body. Many parts of the body can harbor cholesterol granuloma. And I'm sure many of you will be surprised to see these sites as sites for cholesterol granuloma, albeit very rare. So ribs can harbor cholesterol granuloma. And this is the histology proving that this is the cholesterol granuloma of the ribs, anterior mediastinum, the histology. Lungs, breast, abdominal wall through the laparoscope, pancreas, huge cyst, granuloma, kidneys, again, historically to prove it and paranasal sinuses. And this is a paper from United States 2012 telling us which paranasal sinus is commonly affected by the cholesterol granuloma. The answer is the frontal. All the studies, but this is one of the largest studies of the paranasal sinus cholesterol granulomas. Uh, that's why I did choose that. But most of the studies shows that frontal sinus is the commonest site for uh, the paranasal sinus cholesterol granuloma, followed by the maxillary little bit ethmoid and sphenoid. So here's a paper, frontal sinus cholesterol granuloma. So we have to stop thinking of cholesterol granuloma as just being a pathology of the, of the uh, temporal bone. It could be anywhere in the body and it could be in the paranasal sinuses, but definitely the commonest site for cholesterol granuloma is the temporal bone. But let's not forget about these unusual sites. Sorry. Sphenoid sinus. Again, this is not this is not empyema, this is not mucosid, this is cholesterol granuloma. And this has been proved histologically. Another sphenoid sinus affected by this cholesterol granuloma. Sphenoid sinus, maxillary sinus, orbit, very beautiful paper from Italy, 2017. So the differential diagnosis when we come to the orbital lesion is very, very wide. Nasal septum. Mandible, even intracranially, cerebral cholesterol granulomas. Paper from Brazil, 2007. These were cholesterol granulomas. 
There are other legions, intracerebral legions. So again, it can happen in any site of the body, but the commonest site is temporal bone in the mastoid, in the middle ear, or in the apex. The commonest is in the uh, petrous uh, bone. So once it is affecting the temporal bone, so it can present in the external ear like this, and this is seen uh, commonly by our TNT colleagues. Another external ear, cholesterol granuloma. This is anterior, posterior, and you can see that. Inner ear. As I said, temporal bone, we mentioned. So these are some of the features of this uh, temporal bone, cholesterol granuloma. They come in different sizes and different shapes. Look here, affecting the mastoid area. Here it's affecting the apex. Here it's extending through the sphenoid sinus. CT showing the destruction. So what are the different other names for this cholesterol granuloma? Called cholesterol cysts, chocolate cysts, unicameral cyst, xanthomas, hemotympanum, blue drum membrane, blue eardrum, blue dome. Cholesterol granuloma has these old names. The one that is accepted by everybody now is cholesterol granuloma. And cholesterol granuloma is totally morphologically, histologically, not a cholesteatoma. So don't confuse the cholesterol granuloma with cholesteatomas. They are two different kettle of fish. Cholesterol granuloma, as you can see here, this is just an illustration of how it goes and how it expands and affects the nearby structures. It is an intraosseous cyst surrounded by a thick fibrous capsule. It's a benign lesion that can behave aggressively. Remember that benign can behave aggressively. It is one case per two million, so it is rare. In fact, it is very rare. So this is a cholesterol granuloma, as you can see it, and how it is related to the carotid artery, how it's related to the ear structures, and usually it wraps itself around the carotid artery. This is a very important uh, feature that we have to remember. Relationship to the petrous carotid. What is the pathophysiology? How they are formed? Let's first refer to some anatomical point and then go for explanation. Remember that petrous apex can be pneumatized in 9 to 30% of cases or morophilled in 70 to 91% of cases. So you can see it's sometimes difference between this and here and there. So you don't need always to see both petrous bones of the same uh, shape and appearance. Also, if you look at the type of pneumatization of the uh, petrous bone, this is called solid, and there's no pneumatization called zero, or grade one pneumatization. Or grade two pneumatization. Look at the hyper pneumatization, hyper radiation, and this is one of the causes of these uh, cholesterol granulomas. I will allude to that later on. Also, you need to know the types of mustoid there, the, the phloic type, the sclerotic type, and the pneumatized type. Because the sites of uh, the cholesterol granuloma is where there are air cells. Air cells are present in the mastoid, in the inner ear, in the external ear, and they are also present in the petrous apex. So the pathophysiology is there are two theories. One is acceptable as the major one, the obstruction theory. Recently, people are exposed, speaking about exposed bar theory. But the one that is really as accepted is the obstruction. But this is a growing evidence that may be uh, coming up uh, to um, fight with the obstruction theory. Let's look at the obstruction theory. As I said, we are referring to air cells in the petrous apex, in the mastoid, or in the middle ear. What happens there? There is obstruction of these air cells. 
on that the obstructed the uh, at the trapped air will be absorbed so the cavity would be decreased in that area the mucosa will get inflamed so the mucosa gets edematous and there is angiogenesis of the blood vessels because there is a new angiogenesis the vessels would rupture once they rupture they will release hemoglobin hemoglobin will break down and will cause cholesterol crystals immediately that will be surrounded by foreign body reaction and we get the cholesterol granuloma. Very feasible, uh, acceptable theory. The second theory, which as a case is gaining uh, uh, popularity, is the exposed marrow theory. Uh, they say that hyperneumatized petrous bone, and we have shown this on the previous slides, this would expose the bone marrow. Once the bone marrow is exposed, then there will be hemorrhage, and then we go through the same cascade, hemorrhage from the bone marrow breakdown of the uh, uh, hemoglobin cholesterol uh, uh, is attacked as, as a foreign body and the granuloma is formed. And this beautiful paper about the histopathological evidence for exposed marrow theory to support uh, this thesis that it is exposed marrow. So it shows you here the cyst and in fact they show you the stent that says sometimes they put. So they say this is exposed marrow assist in relation to the fat of the bone marrow inside the bone. Uh, the statement here is say, saying uh, this uh, cholesterol granuloma is not a specific disease entity. It's rather a histological term describing a tissue response to obstruction of a normally pneumatized bone due to trauma or other ear diseases, especially adhesive or typhus media. Let me make this very clear. Cholesterol granuloma is not always following uh, uh, middle ear disease or adhesive or hepatitis media. Uh, in fact, it is very small percentage, I think 15 to 20% only. So the, basically there is obstruction and there is usually history of middle ear disease or trauma or whatever. And this is chronic hepatitis media. It's present in only 12% to 15% of cases. So it can occur without any previous history of infection. So don't think that every time you take history from the patient that he will give you history of middle ear disease and then followed by the cholesterol granuloma. In 85% of cases, there is no such history. My two colleagues, Professor uh, Sam Farsha and Professor Hassan and Nab, both are uh, fellows of American College of Pathologists. They are the main pathologists I'm dealing with. And they serve me really great with the histological evidence. They do every neurostaining you know. Uh, they are very elaborate. They go in depth to give me the best results of histopathology. Uh, so they show me in their slides foreign body giant cells. They show me foam cells, macrophages filled with hemosiderin, fibrous granulation tissue, focal bleed, cholesterol eclipse. And this is very important and almost one of the pathognomonic features of these cholesterol granulomas. So this is cholesterol granuloma histology, cyst wall lined by the feeder cells and cholesterol clefts, surrounded by foreign body J and cell reaction. The prominent features of cholesterol granuloma are the cholesterol clefts. Once you see these clefts, this is very diagnostic. And uh, this is without a material element which the stigma just uh, from cholesteatoma. Cholesteatoma, they have epithelial elements, the crystal granuloma don't. Uh, with the uh, sudan black stain, you can see high fat content in the macrophages because we are dealing with uh, bone marrow exposed, as I said. Uh, EMA, the CD68, and the negative uh, neuro staining GFAP, S100, CD1A, uh, B catenine are always negative in this kind of pathology. How do they present? We know they are located in the petrous bone and the close proximity to the sonoid sinus, to the clivus, to the otic capsule, to the antenna carotid artery, uh, to the antenna detrimiatus as the presentation of these cases. Looking in general, the commonest presentation is hearing loss. Commonest presentation. Vertigo, headache, occipital headache, tinnitus, 
of all, all uh, features of this presentation, but the commonest is hearing loss. So presentation depends on the size and location. Are we dealing with approximation to the cochlea, leading to hearing loss, vestibular vertigo, dizziness, headaches, traction on the dura, facial nerve. This is very, very unusual to have it. Uh, cranial nerves, uh, the involvement, including abduction is rare. Facial numbness is rare. But these are one of the features that you can come across. And you may get chronic discharge in uh, ear. So facial nerve is rare presentation. You don't see it in cholesterol glioma. So often, unless it is large and left unattended to. This is one paper showing you this facial nerve presentation in this uh, lady. This is from beyond France. Another interesting paper that uh, there is a cholesterol granuloma in this family with familial hypercholesteremia. So hypercholesteremia in the blood may be associated with bilateral cholesterol granuloma. Not necessarily, but this is something to uh, look at. This is from uh, Saudi Arabia, a paper, very interesting paper. Another paper from Korea. Uh, the cholesterol granuloma area is presenting as endolymphatic uh, sac problem, high drops, and here's disease. This is another paper showing cholesterol granuloma presenting as signal palsy. You can see here the cholesterol granuloma, and you can see the, the, the abducens nerve as it goes into the relus canal being compressed by this cholesterol granuloma. Here. What about the images? And I'll concentrate on the images that I have from my series. But basically, what you want to see in these uh, CTs and MRIs uh, are the structures that interest you and that you need to know about before embarking on surgery. And one of them is this Petrus carotid uh, outline. You want to see if there's any destruction, and usually there is. You want to see if there is eroding of the internal deuteromiatus, and there is. You want to see if there is erosion of the basal uh, turn of the cochlea. You know, cochlea is two and a half turns. Basal uh, uh, turn can be affected by these cholesterol granulomas. You want to see if there is extension into the jugular foramen. They can extend from the vitreous to the jugular, causing the jugular foramen syndrome as in this case. This is not my case. This is from uh, Osmond book. What about MRI? MRI is very, very efficient. It shows you tendotomiatus, the cochlea, the semicircular canals, and the petrous adux. So you can see the granulomas, different sizes and shapes. This is a giant uh, cholesterol granuloma, not in my series. Again, uh, large one here, cholesterol granuloma. Uh, this is one of the large granulomas. This is from my series, a very large giant, uh, more than four centimeters in diameter, cholesterol granuloma. I will present this at the end of this uh, presentation. Combining the MRI and CT, you will get full information about how to go and where to go. Cholesterol granuloma, CT, destruction, large cholesterol granuloma, destroying the bone completely. So combination of MRI and CT will give you beautiful uh, knowledge of the anatomy and the pathology that you are going to deal with the cases of MRI and CT. You may get bilateral cholesterol granuloma. Don't forget that. Not necessarily unilateral, but you can get bilateral cholesterol granuloma if there is obstruction in both uh, petrous ABCs. MRA is important. You want to see the relationship with the vertebral artery and the vesicular artery in case of these giant uh, ones. 
MRV is very important. If you want to embark on surgery on the posterior fossa, you need to know exactly where you are and you need to see uh, vein of Labe and you need to see betrothal sinus if you want to uh, use the betrothal approaches. So it's very important and essential. MRI, MRA, MRV are one unit for me. And sometimes you get surprises with this uh, venogram or MRV, you'll get the occipital sinus. Now, if you are not aware of it, then you are in trouble. Spear vitrosal sinus, inferior vitrosal sinus, vein of la bay. Here is again another uh, occipital sinus, but very unusual starting from here in the there. One of the recent patients I had. Once you see petrous bone lesions, don't only think of cholesterol as I know, but he a differential diagnosis is very, very, very wide. Let's see. Petrous lesions, inflammatory, petrous apex symbol effusion, mucosy, petrous epicytis, tumors, metastasis, giant cell, aneurysmal bone cyst, Langerhans histocytosis, rhabdomyosarcoma, plasma cytoma, hemangioma, vascular lesions like aneurysm, invasion by tumors from the petri adenoma, nasopharyngeal carcinoma, schwannomas, paraganglioma, etc., etc. Let's look at some of these cases affecting the petrous bone chordoma, chondroma, chondrosarcoma, histocytosis, aneurysm of the petrous uh, carotid, fibrous dysplasia. They love the, the base of the skull, it, uh, fibrous dysplasia. Menjoblastoma, the cell tumor, glomerular jugulari, aberrant carotid, not aneurysm, but it is aberrant, metastasis, encephalocele, like meningocele, meningomyocele, going into the vitreous bone, rhabdomyosarcoma, nasopharyngeal carcinoma, plasma cytoma, endolymphatic sac tumors, dermoid, epidermoid, meningioma, for the uh, petroclival area, plasmocytoma, trigeminal schwannoma, and jugular schwannoma. So differential diagnosis is very wide. But if one, one wants to choose, what is the most common petrous apex lesion, cholesterol granioma is the commonest. There are lesions that are begging you to leave them alone. And there are lesions that they are begging you to interfere. Please help me. Please uh, take me out from the skull of this patient. And some other lesions, they are begging you, leave me alone, leave this patient alone. So let's look at them. One of the lesions that you should leave alone, and it is begging you to leave alone. And unfortunately, I have seen so many cases referred to me for surgery. When they are fat, you they don't need surgery. So it was for the pleasure of the patient who was coming, uh, thinking that he's going to have a major skull-based surgery. When you tell him you do not need surgery, and I always cooperate with my ENT colleagues in this respect. So, uh, fatty marrow or non-pneumatized apex. It is not pneumatized; it's full of marrow. So when you compare, oh, this is normal, this is abnormal, oh, this is cholesterol granuloma. Let's go for it. Don't go for it. Please leave me alone. Again, similar pictures. One may ask, how could, can I differentiate between this and that? They look the same. Uh, I will show you how we can differentiate. I put here the cholesterol granuloma, and this is the asymmetric bone marrow. And some features, they are the same. Hyperintense in T1, hyperintense in T2. They don't take contrast. There's no change with the fat saturation. So they look the same, but look here. If you do the CT, there's no abnormal density changes on the asymmetric and bone marrow. And there's no bony destruction in the asymmetric and bone marrow. And there is no tropiculation in the uh, fatty marrow. So you can, as a neurosurgeon, not as a radiologist only, but as a neurosurgeon, you can tell the difference and save your patient from unnecessary operation that can end in a very bad way. Uh, another lesion that is begging you to leave it alone is the effusion, simple effusion. It's a trapped fluid. So this is the picture. Again, difference between the petrous apex on both sides. But this is a fluid, simple effusion. Leave alone. Maybe you'll give some patients some analgesia, but that's all. 
So these are the pictures of the uh, effusion, simple effusion. Again, you may say, oh, they are, they are the same. They may look the same, but again, looking carefully, you can differentiate. And this is the differentiation between cholesterol granuloma and diffusion. This is hyperintense, this is iso or hyperintense. With cholesterol granuloma do not enhance. This may show some slight enhancement. And uh, uh, in, in both here, they are hyperintense. The other feature is the intact septation in the effusion. Uh, the other lesions, they are begging you, don't leave me, don't leave me alone, please do something. Cholesteatoma is something that you need to treat, and it is different morphologically, histologically from cholesterol granuloma. Again, on the MRI or CT, they may look the same. But no, they, is, there are some differences between cholesterol granuloma and cholesterol and, and the main difference here is in cholesterol you will find restriction on DW, the fusion, fusion while in cholesterol granuloma there is no restriction. You can see, sometimes you need to treat, uh, especially if you got infected. Apical pterocytis. Pyema of the apex of the Petrus uh, apex. Epicytis. And there is usually enhancement. Remember, in cholesterol granuloma, there is no enhancement. Again, you can differentiate between the cholesterol granuloma and the apex petrocytis. One is hyper, one is hypo in T1 and T2. And with enhancement, apical petrocytis enhance. So as a neurosurgeon, you need to know a lot about the neuroradiology. You need not to depend on the radiologist report. You need to make your own diagnosis and hopefully your opinion and the neurologist would match, then everybody is happy. In cephalocene, where there is a herniation of the meninges, CSF, and sometimes brain tissue into the vitreous bone, Another lesion that can uh, go, like in cephalocele, is going through the esphenoid or ethmoid and presenting as a nasal mass in children. And cephalocele can be actually sometimes bilateral. Again, if one puts this list of epidermoids, dermoids, arachnoids, lipoma, aneurysm, cholesterol, granuloma, paraglioma, chordoma, chondroma, epicondylitis, and look at T1, T2, and whether there is enhancement and other features, most likely you will reach to diagnosis and save your patients from unnecessary unnecessary surgeries if you are careful. What is the treatment of these cases? If they are asymptomatic, you don't need to do anything. Just observe no serial imaging. If they are symptomatic, you have the two options, open surgery or endoscopy. So, Small asymptomatic cholesterol granuloma should not be operated upon. You follow them yearly. Maybe the first MRI or CT is done after six months or three months, but then you follow them yearly. If there is no change, you just keep the follow up. Three months becomes six months and then becomes one year. If it is there is a growth or symptoms, then you need to interfere surgically, open surgery, or endoscopy. Again, the treatment here depends on the location, the size, and the health of the patient, comor comorbid diseases, uh, complications that happen to the patient, loss of hearing, his age, so many factors that you should consider. Basically, the features of this surgery, whether endoscopy or open, some people will just go and penetrate to drain the cyst, and they put a stent to keep the drainage. Some people say, no, this is not enough. We have to excise and we have to obliterate the cavity. Some people do that, some people do that. I believe in this. I believe in excision and not just fenestration and stent. And once you obliterate the, the, the cavity, you obliterate with fat or muscle or both. If the hearing is lost, then you may go for translabyrinthine or transcochlear because hearing is lost. 
if the hearing does not last, then you go, you don't go trans, labyrinthine, transcochlear, you go infracochlear, infralabyrinthine, retrolabyrinthine, or middle fossa to avoid uh, the hearing uh, loss. We always do an uh, audiogram before and after the procedure, and we use the navigation. <clears throat> Open surgery approaches to the petrous apex, petrous bone, variable, middle fossa, transpetrous one, as you said, with different types, retrosigmoid. Uh, again, this is from uh, Sana, uh, Sana book. Uh, the uh, transtemporal middle fossa, transsteroidal, uh, transmastoid, infralabyrinthine, subcochlear, transmastoid, and so on. So, so many uh, approaches, whether used by uh, neurosurgeons or uh, ENT surgeons or endoscopists to the uh, neurosurgeon or ENT. So, middle fossa approach, uh, popularized by Kawase. A beautiful paper from uh, Isama and Mufti, Mark Eisenberg, back in 97, of middle fossa approach to take this cholesterol granuloma and fill the cavity with muscle pedicle. Again, uh, here I have referred to also my colleague, George Haddad from Lebanon, son of Fahd Haddad, one of the very first neurosurgeons in the Middle East, if not the very first neurosurgeon in the Middle East from Lebanon. And here, as you said, the transcochlear approach, the translabyrinthine approach, the retrolabyrinthine uh, approach, and the uh, retromastoid approach. And here, transpetrosal or Kawasi approach, the fossa approach, stereopetrosal approach, or pre sigmoid approach. Again, very, very nicely illustrated in Mad Sana book. You can actually read it very carefully and he will take you step by step of how to do this uh, surgery. Here on the left side, this is the middle fossa, this is the posterior fossa, posterior fossa dura, middle fossa dura, the uh, uh, sigmoid sinus and jugular bulb, and the other structures that you'll see as you go through. You can see the jugular malvian sigmoid sinus, the facial nerve, the semicircular canals. Same picture, facial nerve. And then you come to this beautiful picture screen, seeing the antenna carotid, the jugular bulb, and the facial nerve. Beautiful illustration that people can read carefully at their leisure time. And the closure. Uh, as I said, you can go retro labyrinthine if the hearing is, is intact. Transmastoid retro labyrinthine or labyrinthine, as the Americans would uh, tell you. Uh, surgical anatomy of the infra labyrinthine approach from Turkey 2014. Uh, again, here, infra labyrinthine approach. And you can see there is a stent tube that has been put after they finished. Transartic, if the hearing is lost, this is from uh, Jackler book, Transcochlear. What about endoscopy? I think endoscopy uh, holds the future of a neurosurgery. I'm very much believing in this, that endoscopy is gonna a rule over a neurosurgery, a line over the neurosurgery, but no one can actually execute surgery. Surgery is still there, but the way the endoscopy is the, the, the evolving and it is pushing the envelope, uh, it's the future of the neurosurgery. Very famous yeah. uh, colleagues of mine, Charles II, I mean, Kassam, Schneiderman, Gardner, Michael Gap, Theodore Schwartz, and my friend, my friend Fred Gentili from uh, from uh, Toronto, Canada. And this beautiful uh, view of the endoscopy of how you can reach into so many parts. So endoscopy is not only transventricular. They go through spaces that no one put that you can go through. Terigoplatine fossa, terigoid, uh, 
the, the Reading Canal and so many other areas uh, uh, that have been put into uh, actual practice. So if hearing is preserved, you do endoscopy either by transphenoid, transclivus, transtergoid, transmastoid. So beautiful uh, paper, I mean custom about approaches to the vitreous. This is one of the early papers actually. And they describe that where is the cholesterol granuloma in relation to the various parts of the carotid. This is the paraclival, this is the cover, the pedras part, and this is the cervical part. So in this part, the cholesterol granuloma is related to the paraclival. Here it is more related to the pedras. Here you have a small window to, to come to the pedras index. Here you have a beautiful window through this spheroid to reach it. Here it's rather difficult to go through the spheroid, through the leading canal to come here. So they call this type A, type B, and type C. So this is type A, related to the paraclival area. Type B, related to the petrous carotid. And type C, related to the cervical carotid. Most of the time for this type, you would need to go into open approach, while here you may go or endoscopy approach. So A and B, endoscopy, C, with difficulty endoscopy, but it is rather good for open approach. Some of the papers about endoscopic transnasal approach for cholesterol granuloma of the vitreous cavix. You can see here they have gone through the sphenoid sinus. Again, another paper from USA, endoscopic internasal putting also a stint inside, endoscopy transphenoidal, coming this way here, you can see the restoration. And as I said, important here in all these approaches, endoscopy or open, is to know the exact location of the carotid artery. Remembering that they like to wrap themselves around the carotid. So you need to pinpoint where is the carotid and avoid any injury to that structure. Endoscopic infracochlear approach. Endoscopic endonasal approach. This is the granuloma, they have removed it and they have put this stent, keep it open. Another endoscopy in the nasal, you can see the paraclival and telecarotid, and they went here into the petrous avix to remove the cholesterol granuloma. And they have left a stent inside, and they have put a mini flap inside. Another uh, technique to close the cavity uh, by muscle is to use the Haddad flap uh, from the septum to fill the cavity. As you can see here, to granulate, and you will not see any granulomas, and you will find a very healthy uh, uh, closure. Transtergoid approach. The same thing, you have to go for the petrous apex. Or you go endoscopy, retrosigmoid. So this is a retrosigmoid approach using the endoscope. You can see the anatomy well. You can see the metrometers, the juvenile nerve, lower external nerve, and you can attack the petrous apex using the endoscope. As I said, uh, some of the uh, features of this drainage is to keep a uh, stent inside or a tube inside to prevent uh, it reaccumulating or recurring again. Stent here, you can see it in post operative period. Same thing here, stent. And here, a long stent. As I said, you use the typical nasal septal flap, known internationally as uh, Haddad flap. Haddad is in, uh, from uh, South America, a surgeon who discovered this uh, nasal septal flap. So it's named after him, Haddad nasal septal flap. Same here. 
Uh, I looked carefully in the literature and found this very recent paper, 2019, from Canada. Somebody attempted to compare meta-analysis, the endoscopic versus the open approaches to the pituitary cervix. Very beautiful paper, detailed paper. They looked at 49 articles, 23 articles for by endoscopy, 26 articles open approaches. You can see that the number here is larger. 210, here it's only 76, but still one can reach to these uh, to comparison. And they looked at the endoscopy and the open, they looked at the approach, the number of patients and the frequency. And they came with, also they looked at the complications and the recurrences, very detailed, most pleasurable reading article. And they came with this uh, finale conclusion. Their patients were between 98 and 2017. Endoscopic nasal approaches, when feasible, should be favored to open surgery with better hearing improvement, less complications, but shorter time to recurrence. I go with that. Endoscopy is should be, to be favored, but there are cases that has to be done by surgery. We have to, not to fight together, but complement each other. Surgery for certain cases, especially the larger ones, that's going to the posterior fossa, and endoscopy for the other ones. Let me tell you about my personal series. And the period between 90 and 2020, I had 31 patients, lost follow-up on eight. I'm reporting to you 23 patients. Uh, so the 31 patients were 25 males and uh, uh, six females. You can see this is a disease mainly of the males. The youngest age I had was 26, the oldest was 70. Some of the axial cuts of my series. This is all uh, large giant ones most, most of the time. Some of them were small. But the majority were large and ugly. So the approaches I used in these patients, retrosig mode was the working horse, 17 cases, middle fossa approach in two cases, pre-sigmoid in two cases, using pre-sigmoid and posterior fossa combined in two cases. I used the sitting position for the retrosigmoid. This is sitting position, semi-sitting position. It's my favorite position. I've been using it for decades. And I've been using for hundreds of cases. People are afraid to use that because of air embolism. I say there is air embolism in every case, but we discover it and we treat it. We have lost only one case over the last 35 years due to air embolism. Uh, neural, uh, neural cranial nerve and uh, monitoring and etc. No mortality in my series. The recurrence I've seen in three cases. Morbidity, as with others, the essence of one CSF fistula, permanent hearing uh, getting worse, permanent facial one, no vascular injury, and very, very long uh, follow. Present to you some of these cases. Case one, uh, this is a patient who came to me from Syria, 46 year old, and interesting enough that he works as a diver. Uh, he dives in the bottom of the sea of Latkia in Syria. And it is a well-known association in males who dive into the deep seas that they develop this. It may cause obstruction. And then we go into the obstruction theory of developing the cholesterol granuloma. So you can see it on the MRI, the destruction here and the other investigations. I'll show you the first video of this man. Sitting position. Uh, here we're trying to cauterize the surface. As I said, there is a fibrous capsule. And 
after filtration, you open it and you will get this oil, old car oil or old oil is coming out. So this thick yellowish oil like. So I'm just gonna proceed now quickly, holding the capsule, going inside. Yeah, it is not just to fenestrate it, it is not enough. You want to excise as much as you can of the capsule and fill the cavity with muscle and fat, safety cell and gel foam. around it now, you can see the cranial nerves appearing after we reduce the size and excise the capsule. I'm insisting on removing the capsule and the attached cure to it. So once that is done, the cavity is filled with muscle and uh, fat and surgical cell and gel foam. This is muscle taken from the suboccipital area. So for me, the energy alone is not enough, but try to excise and fill the cavity with uh, muscle and so on. I use here the uh, dural sealant also. Okay. So this is a simple case, and uh, uh, this is the uh, pre-operative, as I mentioned, and this is the uh, post-operative of this man from Syria. So then, over the years, no recurrence. Case number two. Uh, this man came from uh, Saudi Arabia with this uh, crystal of angioma extending into the CP angle look at the amount of destruction. Let's see the video of this man. Again here, sitting position, opening the capsule, getting the fluid out. It's not enough. You need to the bulk, and you can see here, holding the capsule, you are holding the capsule of the tumor. It's thick capsule, look at that. That's why I say drainage alone is not enough. You need to really excise that capsule, which is acting as a space to my lesion. So it's not just a simple cyst and the drain. You have to, and this is the uh, muscle, the temporalis muscle that we put back to the approach and the closure. That's with my colleague, Dr. Tarek Fris, the ENT surgeon. We've lost the man for about five years. He was not there. He went back to Saudi Arabia and came back with ful fulminant recurrence. And he had facial weakness. Remember, facial weakness is one of, one of the early manifestations, but this man with this huge recurrence of his cultural glioma, he had a facial weakness. And once that is established, most of the time, there is no coming back of the function. However, we went in and we did surgery for him. Again, we found the same kind of structures, very thick capsule. So almost as a replica of the first surgery, this is using the erythrosigmoid. And here you can see that we have used the erythrosigmoid and the pre-sigmoid at the same time to get rid of this uh, 
bleeding. So this is erythrosigmoid, and here is presigmoid. And we fill the cavity with fat and muscle in the usual pattern. Okay, we can stop here. And this is the post-operative, you can see I've done a good retrosectomy uh, here of the affected bone. As I said, post-operatively, he remained having this uh, weakness. Uh, for them, uh, 2011, uh, he still had the facial weakness, which improved very slightly, but he had well healed uh, once, and his hearing was uh, lost from the very beginning. Case number three, uh, the man from Iraq, 70-year-old man with this giant cholesterol glioma. I'll show you the video. <clears throat> Again, opening the capsule, thick material, sectioning around the structures. It's actually acting like a tumor in the posterior force and the CP angle. And you can see the tissues that they are moving. Drainage is not enough. You have to excise the lesion and fill the cavity. Very big lesion. Again, here you can see the anatomy well, having decompressed the posterior fossa and the usual muscle and fat uh, closure. Uh, this is the post operative appearance of the patient, and he was doing very well without any complications, followed four years. Uh, this interesting case of a 65-year-old man from Saudi Arabia uh, with a chronic otitis media. This is the only one who presented us with the history of a chronic otitis media. The others did not. So this man, as a child, had mastoidectomy and anaplasty 2002, uh, and he came to us with this cholesterol granuloma, causing the destruction. Uh, when he came to us, he had left facial weakness, maybe with the previous surgeries that he had, and the new lesion of cholesterol glioma, he developed left facial weakness. So we operated upon him. Again, uh, same, the same appearance actually, uh, taking the cyst wall and decompressing it completely and filling the cavity, okay. Put on three, this is pre-operative, this is post-operative. Okay, let us see you every three months for uh, the initial follow-up, but it's like the first patient, he was lost for follow-up for six years. He came back with increased left sixth nerve pulse. And major recurrence of his cholesterol granuloma. So we opt for a radical uh, approach and we did a uh, pre sigmoid approach. Uh, myself and my colleague, uh, Dr. Tark Hris, uh, who actually trained with Professor Sana in Italy. And he uh, wrote, uh, he was one of the co authors of the, many of the books that was published there. So I'm proud of uh, this Jordanian ENT pathologist. Here we are removing the part of the bone from the dura of the middle fossa. And then you can see the facial nerve and then you go deeper inside 
into the cochlea and the internal frontal artery to remove the structures here, then you go into the uh, labyrinth because he had lost hearing, he has lost, as you said, the facial nerve. So uh, this is attacking the labyrinthine. And this is the amazing angle. Facial nerve, cochlea, carotid. And you'd be amazed how much tumor there is inside there. So that's why we went into a uh, for a radical approach. And we want to remove everything we can here in the distance possible. The lineage is not enough. Still facial canal is seen here, being discolonized. And you could look at the amount of the lesion there. It's uh, actually like a tumor, large tumor-like uh, structure. So oh, here is the finale, putting in the muscle and the fat that we have prepared, the dual seal and so on. We follow this man up. This is immediate post-operative. His facial uh, paralysis has increased and you can see the bony work that has been done, almost total petrosectomy. And this is the fat that we have inserted there. For the home, 2011. No recurrence, 12 no recurrence, facial nerve function came back as normal. 2013, 2015, 16, no recurrence, facial nerve function beautiful, 2017, 2018, facial nerve is fully back, almost. So this is the uh, finale, the conclusion of uh, this webinar that surgical approach, once they are symptomatic, is influenced by so many factors, by your experience, by the size of the lesion, whether healing is there or lost, whether there is facial nerve lost or not, the location, the relation to the jugular bulb, the relation to the internal carotid artery. But the mismanagement, to my mind, is excision and cavity infiltration. Penetration and drainage is inadequate and it is prone to failure due to the nature of granuloma and the contents. Hearing does not improve in cases of total preoperative hearing loss. This is one of the observations we have faced. With this, we, I finish and I thank you for being patient with me and we will uh, take your questions and then do the, the test. Very good. Thank you, Dr. Sabea. Okay, the floor is open. Dr. Zayden, you're quiet. That's unusual. Are you there, Dr. Zayden? May have yes, stepped away. Yes, I'm, yes, I'm there, Mr. Bennett. How are you? Oh, uh, good. How are you doing? كيف حالك دكتور صباح إن شاء الله بخير. Thank you very much. Hello. يعطيك العافية. فعلا شغل. It's very interesting, very beautiful, and I have no comments. Really. Okay. The Thank only you. thing, the only thing is asking. Uh, uh, when you have very adherent or recurrent cases and the capsule is there and impossible to remove from the vital organs, uh, do you tend to go for the stents at that time? I mean, after marsupialization as much as you can? No, still, yeah, I mean, you have to persevere to remove as much as you can, except for the cases, as I said, that is really attached to the carotid or whatever, and then you have to leave. But the main, the main bulk of the capsule must be removed. Leaving the stent to me is not uh, really managing these cases. No, I, I'm talking about if there are adherent uh, parts of the capsule on the facial nerve, on the sixth nerve, or somewhere yeah. where you think that you cannot remove it unless you injure the nerve at that moment. I have not. Don't you? Uh, don't uh, yeah, don't you I leave? Have not, I have not come to that situation in my series, but maybe I would if I faced the same situation. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, very I see, see Dr. Ala Adasi, um, medical oncologist. So, are you there, Ala? 
Can you un unmute yourself? Hello, Dr. Ala. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Again, presentation again, I'll just remind the, the, the viewers that uh, you look like Che Guevara, but without Fidel Castro, we are alone. <laughs> okay. <laughs> God have mercy on their souls both. <laughs> May I just remind the audience, the trainees in the audience, that the differential diagnosis slides that uh, you cordially uh, shared with us, these are actually true cases. You're going to get cases that masquerade uh, 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 easily as uh, cholesterol granulomas. Don't kindly do not forget that you don't want to miss chondrosarcomas in this region. You really don't want to uh, the, the 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 mainstay of uh, which treatment would be uh, surgery, of course, because the radiotherapy doesn't work. Chemotherapy definitely does not work. Uh, please uh, uh, be cognizant of the fact that you may miss plasma cytomas in this uh, uh, region that must create its cross uh, granulomas, and you should do the workup to make sure that this is not part of a systemic disease like multiple myeloma. And, and if indeed, if it's localized and it's plasma cytoma with no evidence of uh, multiple myeloma, then the mainstay uh, of treatment would be radiotherapy. Um, these are actual cases that looked as something uh, like cholesterol granulomas. These are actual cases from, from your uh, personal series. I can, we cannot hammer this point enough because if they're missed, the patient uh, uh, is doomed, particularly if this is a chondrosarcoma case. Right, thank you very much. Uh, and again, emphasizing the point yeah, that you mentioned, differential diagnosis is very wide. And people should not just limit themselves to two or three pathologies in any area of the brain. I know lots of people would think of the supracellular lesion as pituitary and the cranial pharyngioma. There are maybe a hundred differential diagnoses there. CP angle, hundred of differential diagnoses there. You have to keep remembering them. You have to remember them and keep them in your mind before you embark on any attempt of surgery or medical treatment. Thank you, Dr. Dassey, for your comments. Any other comments? Uh, hello, hello, <coughs> hello, Dr. Ibrahim. Can hello. you hear me? Yes, yes we can. This is Dr. Hassan Abu Farsak. Yeah, he's our uh, histopathologist with Dr. Hassan al -Nab. Please, Dr. Hassan, can you add to the histopathology features yeah. of this lesion? Yeah, uh, I want to add on. Uh, uh, thank you for a uh, very ex uh, ex uh, extensive uh, approach to uh, 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 cholesterol granuloma. Uh, I want to add that cholesterol granuloma is can be primary where you cannot see any other things beside it, like uh, there is no tumors and uh, yes. no infarction, but can also be secondary. Uh, yes. I want to emphasize that the secondary cases that we see, uh, because cholesterol granuloma can be part of many tumors. It can be part of uh, uh, craniofrangioma, we see it a lot, can be part of uh, uh, epidermoid tumor and can be part of uh, sometimes infarction. We see them and so can, can be seen also in bilocytic astrocytoma. And sometimes I saw one case where uh, with fungus, with aspergillus, because the fungus wall is uh, fat and when it is destroyed, um, uh, it can cause cholesterol granuloma. Sure. So when you see cholesterol granuloma, you really have to search for all the other secondary causes before you call it, you call it primary. Uh, cholesterol granuloma. And um, one of the most common uh, cholesterol, primary cholesterol granulomas, as Dr. Ibrahim Speh mentioned or alluded to, is the bitter spawn. Uh, in other sites, actually, when you see it, really, you have to search for all the other causes that t tissue that is being destroyed and containing fat because it's cholesterol. Yes. Cholesterol is a foreign reaction to our body. Okay. Uh, thank you. This is my, my point that I want to allude to. Thank you, Hassan, very much indeed. In fact, you are emphasizing the point, as I mentioned, that there are so many regions that can approach into the petrous bone, invade the petrous bone, cause obstruction, and cause cholesterol granuloma. So, pituitary tumor invading there, um, uh, craniopharyngioma invading there, chordoma, chondrosarcoma invading the petrous apex can obstruct the uh, apex, the air cells, 
and cause granuloma sorts. In, in this case, it is secondary to invasion by other tumors. Thank you. Okay, any more questions? We may move to the quiz. If not, any more before we move to the quiz? I think everyone is so anxious to move to the quiz. Right, that's right. <laughs> they, they can't. They can't stand the anticipation. Okay, here's we're doing uh, the Kahoot.it. I'm going to show you basically uh, what to do. You need to with your computer device. You need to go to k a h o o t dot i t, and it looks like this. And I'm going to give you that pin in just a second here. Let me myself go to uh, the uh, correct website and, and we'll get smoother with this production. Okay, play. Okay, let me share here. And, and the advantage of this is people that are watching can participate too. Uh, and not only pe and people in the panel can participate. Okay, okay, I'm gonna put play. And you can see this, right, Abraham? Yes, of course. Okay, oh, oh, hold on. Hold on, let me make sure. Okay, well, wait a minute here. Uh, wait, 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 wait. No, no, that's not, it. I'm sorry. Don't worry. Production here is not the, the best. Okay, let me try again. Okay, log in. Okay, Kahoot. Okay. Okay. I don't know if this. Okay. Okay, this is it, I believe. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to share the screen here. Okay, that's the pin six eight one one eight three zero. You can see that, right, Abraham? Yes, I can. Okay. Okay, and I'm going to join that as a couple of devices to show you. Couple of people in there. Okay, they're getting uh, slowly. One. One. Okay, I, th I think we may be ready to start. Yeah, I think so. Okay, here we go. Here we go. And just, you, you use the smartphone and you vote according to the answers, okay? Okay, here we, you use the smartphone and you click the color. Okay, five answers. 
Okay, very good. As you can see, Dr. Sebea, uh, someone learned something there. Yeah, cholesterol granulomas are the commonest, no doubt about that. Cordomas and cholesterol is very, very uh, down on the list. Cholesterol granulomas form something like 70% of or 80% of the cases of fibrous apex. But we have to attend to these small ones, 4%, 5% of other lesions. The commonest petrous abex lesion is uh, cholesterol granuloma. Very good. Let's go to the next one. I'm going to say for cholesterol. I'm sorry. What's the rest of that? Maybe I missed part of it. It's going to stand for cholesterol granuloma and the paranasal sinuses. Okay. Okay, I'm sorry, I missed that question there. No, no problem, no problem. Common sites for cholesterol granuloma in the paranasal sinuses. Okay, I'm sorry. that was my mistake there. Okay, let's go to the next one and let's forget about the mistake. No. Most accepted theory in the formation of cholesterol granuloma. Is it the infection theory or obstruction theory or the congenital theory? A lot of answers here. Okay, well, very good. Obstruction Pretty good. Is the commonest. It is acceptable all around. But as I said, the uh, uh, the uh, theory of exposed bone marrow is coming up. Still not as strong as obstruction. Infection, as I said, and I alluded to that uh, previous infection, middle ear, and so on as only 12, 15% of cases, congenital theory is very, very weak. So the commonest theory for the formation of cholesterol granulomas is the obstruction theory. Very good. Okay, next question. Commonest presentation of cholesterol granuloma. Is it facial palsy? Is it hearing loss? Is it tinnitus? Very good. Perfect. The commonest and the others come uh, in a small percentage or uh, very late. So facial palsy, tinnitus. Tinnitus is commoner than facial palsy, but hearing loss is the main uh, presentation. So be careful about male patients coming to you with hearing loss uh, uh, for the good diagnosis of uh, cholesterol granule. Very good. Next. The best treatment of cholesterol granuloma is simple drainage, drainage plus stent or excession. Okay. So excession, excession is the main uh, line of treatment of these uh, lesions. Uh, you don't need to remove all of them, and this is maybe uh, alluding to what Dr. Antala Zidane asked. Do we need to remove all of the capsule? No. Uh, sometimes you leave some there, but once you clean it and you want to uh, fill it with fat and, and so on, fat muscle and sealant and gel foam and so on, uh, that would be enough. Would you consider drainage plus 10 or no? No. No, okay. No, Very no, good. No. Okay. Temporal bone is made of how many parts? So the temporal bone is the most complex bone in our body. Uh, really to master it is to master the skull base. It is a must reading. It is a must go into depth of this uh, bone because it will really solve lots of real problems. So how many parts the temporal bone is made of? A equal there? Uh, uh, equal there, but it is nine parts, as I said. I have put three parts, which is impossible, five parts, which is not. So either one say six parts, which is, as you said, is the squamous, petrous, mastoid, hylomastoid, tympanic, and the zygomatic. Uh, but people sometimes forget to put the three ossicles. So the six major parts of the temporal bone now comes to nine parts, three ossicles and the six main parts. 
Very good. Thank you. Okay, next one. So many parts of the facial nerve, and we are asking about the horizontal segment. Do we call it labyrinthine part? Do we call it natal part? Or do we call it tympanic part? The last one is tympanic. It's not titanic, tympanic. So labyrinthine, meatal, tympanic. Okay, equal across the board there. Yes, ah, yes. And again, meatal part is impossible. Uh, labyrinthine part is not there. Actually, the horizontal part is the tympanic part. And that's followed by the vertical part. Yo pensé the... que me había estirado un músculo. Sí, sí. Pero después me siguió su... I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay, I'm sorry. That's an interference. Okay, no, no, we'll go no. to the next yeah. question. So we're asking about the McEwen triangle of the mastoid. Uh, this is a simple question to the ENT, but major question to the neurosurgical residents. McEwen triangle. It points to what? To the facial nerve? course to the cochlear nerve course or to the letters to mastoid ourselves okay. the answer is uh, nobody answered it right it is the uh, landmark for the editors to the mastoid oh okay got that completely wrong yeah. okay very good genical ganglion of the facial nerve transmits what related superficial vitrosal nerve the lizard superficial vitrosal nerve or the deep vitrosal nerve. Geniculate is where the labyrinthine part meets the tympanic part of the facial nerve. Okay. So greater superficial vitrosal nerve is the correct answer. All right. And that's the second one they nailed. That's right. The canal is a landmark for what? Petrus apex, or Petrus carotid, or abducens nerve. Okay, okay. so it is a landmark for the Petrus apex. The correct answer, number one, is the correct answer. Oh wow, that's a toughie. Yeah. Uh, uh, you don't want to use the video canal to go to the carotid artery because you, this way you would injure it. And you don't want to uh, go to the abducens nerve, which is really far from the area of the video canal. But it is the landmark to go to the petrus apex. Okay, very good. We'll get better with that uh, platform. Yeah, sure. and, and the great thing is that people that are watching can participate uh, okay. and uh, they'll get to know it. Okay. Uh, so any topic uh, yet for next week, uh, any idea? Uh, next week I have two uh, presentation, one with the uh, in India for the complications of neurosurgery and another one with uh, Professor uh, Sam and Mifti uh, and uh, Luis Borba uh, making this day for uh, Professor uh, Sam and Mifti. Okay, so so busy next week. But we resume after that. Oh, so we'll okay. So it'll be two weeks, weeks from today. two weeks from today. Two weeks from today, and okay. we are going to talk about a very interesting topic, which is not really approached frequently, and that is the uh, the the uh, tuber sinirum uh, tumors, uh, or the lower uh, the lower part of the floor of the third ventricle tumors. Uh, kind of what the tumors do we face there, especially in the tumors that present with the, the so-called gelastic seizures. So it's a topic that interests the neurologists, the neurosurgeons, the endoscopists, and everybody. Very good. Okay, thanks all the panelists for coming, and thanks to Dr. Sabea, Thank and we'll much. see you in two weeks. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye.